Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Bonsoir. Il me fait grand plaisir d'être avec vous ce soir. Et je remercie les organisateurs de m'avoir invité à vous parler. I'm going to speak about the topic of governance this evening, but before that, I'd like to say a few, a few words to express my admiration for the YMCA. It is fair to say that you are an institution in this country, both because of your longevity, how many organizations have survived for more than 160 years, and in fact thrived during that time, but also because of the tremendous contribution that you make to communities across Canada. The range of activities that you conduct from swimming lessons to daycare to newcomer services is impressive. And I am particularly pleased to see that your work you do on Aboriginal issues, from the services you provide to Aboriginal youth to Scott's exceptional contribution as chair of the National Panel on First Nation Elementary and Secondary School Education of Students on Reserve. Now, as you may be aware, during my term as Auditor General, we conducted a number of audits on First Nations issues, including education. The results were disappointing, to say the least. And the most troubling was that the follow-up audit that we did at the end of my tenure term showed that little to no progress had been made. Our audit showed that while the proportion of high school graduates has steadily risen in the general population in Canada, the same cannot be said for First Nations students living on reserve. And in fact, data would indicate that the gap is growing. The work of Scott's panel was important in addressing some of the fundamental issues. And we can only hope that government and First Nations leadership work together to implement the recommendations and improve the educational outcome of these young people. Another YMCA initiative that I would like to highlight is the work that you have been doing to bring Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth together. I first saw a group of young people at the Cochetine Conference last summer, then again at the Edmonton National Event of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which I attended as an honorary witness. As some of you may know, the commission was established as part of the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, the largest class action in the history of Canada. Residential schools were established in the 1870s with the last one closing in 1996. And in fact, there were more than 130 schools across the country. More than 150,000 First Nations, Métis and Inuit children attended these schools. And I have to admit that I suspect like many of you, I knew nothing about the schools and their devastating impact on the students and their families. And while most of us would think of our time at school in positive terms, the experiences of those attending residential schools was anything but. The Commission has held seven national events where survivors of the schools share their experiences. I've attended three of these events and heard heartbreaking stories from many courageous former students. Stories of being forcibly removed from their families, of not being allowed to speak their language, of being separated from their parents, and of children who went to schools never to return, their families never knowing what had happened to them. And one of the saddest comments I heard was that these survivors had to, and I quote, overcome their childhood. The impact of the residential schools has been felt not only by those who attended, but by their children and their grandchildren. And learning the truth of this shameful part of our history helps to explain the many social problems facing Indigenous communities across our country. But seeing the young people of the 4Rs movement present an, an expression of reconciliation to the Commission gave hope that positive change can and will occur. That their efforts, as well as the, as the efforts of many others, will lead to a renewed relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples based on understanding and respect and I applaud you for encouraging and supporting this important initiative. The YMCA also deserves our respect for having remained relevant and managed to thrive for so many years. Studies have shown that the average life of a Fortune 500 company is roughly 40 to 50 years. Now I tried to find similar data for nonprofits, but to no avail. 
but I would suspect that the average life is probably not that different from the private sector. And the YMCA's accomplishment is particularly notable in this era of increasing expectations and quickly changing realities. In recent years, there have been several high-profile scandals in both the private and public sectors, and the not-for-profit charitable sector has not been spared by similar events. Regularly, we read reports of improper use of donations, conflicts of interest, or embezzlement of funds. And as a result of these scandals, the public has been calling for more accountability and transparency. They want systems in place to protect their interests be they shareholders, taxpayers, donors, or recipients of services. They want their institutions to undergo greater scrutiny and more vigilant oversight. They want their leaders to adhere to sound values and ethics. In short, they want good governance. Now, much has been written about the elements of good governance, and one helpful source is the 20 question series produced by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Canada. There is a specific series for nonprofits with questions that directors could ask on subjects ranging from governance to human resources, director fiduciary duty, and so on. They are available on the CPA website free of charge, and if you're interested, I would encourage you to have a look. Now, I know that several of you have attended a session today on governance, so I hope you're not too tired of the subject. As tonight, I would like to discuss four elements of good governance. The relationship between board and management, board effectiveness, values and ethics, and finally, risk management. Boards of directors play an essential role in the sound functioning of an organization. They are, in fact, a key control by providing independent, objective, and thoughtful oversight and guidance. The relationship between board and management is key Management must accept and embrace the oversight role of the board, and the board must recognize that it does not actually run the organization. That's management's job. There is often discussion about whether a board should remain at a very high level or if it should go deep into issues. There is, in fact, no hard and fast rule. The extent of board involvement will depend on the particular issue and its importance to the organization. The board may need to go into great detail to understand an issue and satisfy itself that it is being handled appropriately by management, but they must take care not to become the managers. This can be a real challenge for all organizations, but I would think especially for charities, where directors are very committed to the cause and may find it difficult to step back into an oversight role. A successful relationship between the board and management is characterized by trust and openness. Do directors feel at ease to ask the difficult question? Or are they intimidated by the CEO or feel somewhat hostage to him or her? Now, in my time as Auditor General, I saw more than one board where the directors were completely dominated by a CEO. In one case, because the CEO was very well connected to the shareholder, had wonderful political connections, and the directors felt completely powerless, so he was allowed to do basically whatever he wanted. In another case, the directors felt that the CEO was so crucial to the success of the organization that they could not challenge him. Now, I can assure you that neither of these stories had a happy ending. In both cases, improper behavior went unchecked, and all suffered, including the board. Another question to ask, is management open and transparent with the board? How are difficulties communicated? Hopefully, the board doesn't learn about them first in the local paper. Does management re re resent a critical challenge? It should be remembered that each party has a role to play, but ultimately, all should be working towards a common goal the success of the organization. Turning now to board effectiveness. There are a number of elements when we talk about the board's ability to effectively oversee the organization, from the process of recruitment to an actual evaluation. And here are some questions to consider. How are board members selected? Have you determined the skill sets you require around the table? 
Is there a wide outreach to identify potential candidates? And does the board reflect the diversity of the community that you serve? Are board members knowledgeable about your operations? Are there onboarding or education sessions to assist directors in understanding the complexities and the risks of the organization? Are members sufficiently engaged? Do they attend meetings? Are they prepared? Do they contribute to the discussion? And finally, is there an assessment of the board and its effectiveness? I recognize that this may be a lot to ask of a not-for-profit where board members are volunteers, but the duties and responsibilities of these directors are no different than those of a large public company. In fact, some would say that they are more onerous given the duty to donors and to the recipients of services. Turning now to values and ethics. I can't emphasize enough how important ethical values are to any organization, but especially a nonprofit. It's important to communicate the values of the organization to all stakeholders, be they directors, employees, volunteers, suppliers, and so on. This is generally done through a code of conduct or similar statement. And while it is important to have clear policies and guidance in this area, what is critical is the actual behavior of people in the organization. The board should assess the mechanisms in place to ensure that the values of the organization are being adhered to. As for the board itself, there should be a policy regarding the independence of board members and conflicts of interest. All board members should be independent of the organization, with of course the exception of the CEO. It is for that reason that it is generally accepted that a director of a charity should not receive any remuneration either directly or indirectly from that charity. For example, through a contract for services with him or his company. In the province of Ontario, for example, a director cannot be paid as a director or for services in any other capacity unless approved by a court order. The question of independence is not only one of fact, but also perception. Some of you may have seen recent reports in the media lately about a former principal of a Toronto school who also ran a charity. Now, we don't know the precise details of that case, but there is certainly a perception of conflict of interest. And we have to remember that public opinion and judgment is often based on perception, not fact. Let me turn now to risk management, which is a topic in all of the boardrooms across this country. Most organizations have a strategic plan which sets out its objectives and strategies and how to meet them. An important part of strategic planning is identifying the risks to the organization, their potential impact, and the likelihood of occurrence. In recent years, risk management has assumed greater importance and has become more formal and structured. As an example, with the financial crisis, regulators are requiring elaborate stress tests from financial institutions to gauge the effect of very severe scenarios to see if the institution could survive. While this level of sophistication is obviously not warranted in most organizations, I do believe that it is useful for organizations to think through various scenarios and the actions that you would take to mitigate the effects. We often focus on the financial and HR risks to an organization. Are we adequately insured? How will new competition affect us? What would happen if we lost a key employee? And so on. But it is important to consider the non-financial, especially the risks to reputation. And Scott mentioned earlier how important reputation is to an organization like the Y. For example, if you considered the impacts of social media, how would you deal with the posts from a dissatisfied client or a disgruntled employee? Have you assessed your capability to deal with cyber attacks? What would you do if data on children enrolled in your daycares was lost through an, uh, an attack? How would you have coped with a situation like the one faced by Boy Scouts of Canada on media reports regarding former employees? Or if there was a widely publicized misuse of funds of a, in a YMCA in another province? How would effect, uh, events like these affect the reputation of your why, and what would you do to limit the impact? It's very difficult to recognize the so-called black swan, 
we only know what we know. But discussing possible scenarios can help to be better prepared. We also have to recognize the, the event you plan for is probably not going to occur. But hopefully that planning will enable you to deal with the one that does. I read with interest Plan Y, the strategic plan of the Federation, and this four strategic goals. Building your brand, increasing your capacity, extending your reach, and strengthening your impact. You have certainly not been faint of heart in establishing your goals, especially for an organization with a federated structure with more than 50 members. Your plan made me think of the slogan, Think Global, Act Local, which, interestingly enough, I learned, is attributed to a Scots social activist in the early 1900s, agreeing on and adopting common values, policies, and accountabilities, sharing knowledge and resources, creating a common brand, all while responding to local needs and circumstances. Certainly not an easy task. Even an organization with a more corporate structure would find these plans challenging to implement. And of course, even harder than implementation is sustaining the change and measuring progress. One often sees the initial enthusiasm wane as the hard realities set in, when people realize how the change will actually affect them and how difficult some of this can be. These transformational initiatives often take several years to come to fruition. So it's important not to lose sight of the initial objectives, even though events along the way will provoke changes to plans. And it's important to measure, to measure progress. What is success? How do you define it? And how will you know if it has happened? You've obviously thought through the transformation needed to respond to new and challenging realities and to ensure that the YMCA continues to play a vital role in our communities and I wish you much success in implementing your plan. Now in closing, I hope that you will indulge me and allow me to say a few words about recent events in Ottawa. <laughs> you thought I would say something, didn't you? <laughs> Some of you have seen commentary lately about the growing gap of respect and trust between the public service and government. Quite frankly, it's not surprising when we see public servants regularly criticized by ministers or comments made by ministers, including the Prime Minister, regarding senior officials, be it the Chief Electoral Officer or the Chief Justice, calling into question their integrity. It would appear that personal attacks are becoming the standard response to those who publicly voice an opinion different from that of government or are seen to impede their agenda. I find it most regrettable that valid issues and concerns are met with personal attacks rather than thoughtful debate and discussion. It is a sign of a healthy democracy that differing views on issues can be voiced in a respectful manner. To attempt to discredit institutions such as Elections Canada or the Supreme Court serves no one well. It will only fuel a growing cynicism and ultimately undermine our democratic traditions. Now I'm certainly not saying that all is perfect in our public service. In an organization as large as the federal government, errors are bound to occur. But I have been impressed by the professionalism and dedication of the people who work for us. Canada is truly fortunate in the quality of its public service, and they deserve our respect for all that they do for us. I thank you for your attention on this Friday evening after dinner, and would be pleased to take your questions. Je vous remercie de l'attention que vous m'avez accordé et il me ferait plaisir de répondre à vos questions. Merci. I am certainly hoping, as we do have time for questions from Sheila, that um, the mic is open. I would ask that uh, for anyone with questions, if you could go to one of the mics in the room and in the spirit of openness and transparency, um, state your name and the association that you're from. Good. I think we have. 
Hi, uh, my name is Helen Francis from the YMCA of Sudbury. First of all, thank you very much for your word, Sheila. Just a quick question. When you get to see maybe some of the lack of transparency and the lack of honesty in so many organizations across Canada, what gives you hope that humanity can improve? Well, I have great, I have great faith in people. Um, I think people ultimately make the right kinds of decisions. If organizations, especially charitable organizations, are not open and transparent, donor dollars are going to go elsewhere. And ultimately, unless they change, they will not survive. So I think there are consequences to not being transparent and open. Now, I think it all depends on the kind of transparency that we expect. Um, in many organizations, certainly the private sector, there is a level of transparency that should be expected, but there is also a level of transparency which would not be appropriate to their own survival. Um, so I think there's a happy balance, and there are people who want to kind of see everything. Um, I think we have to be careful, too, with the amount of, of detail and information that is requested, um, because we can also become overloaded with a whole lot of data uh, and not actually see the meaningful kind of information that is really needed. But I do think there has been a lot, there has been a lot of change, um, I'd say over the last 10 to 15 years in the amount of transparency uh, and the social pressures that are being put on organizations uh, to provide more information. Hi, Sheila. Over here on the left here. I'm trying to find you. Right here. Uh, right. Oh, okay, okay. Hi, yeah. Dallas Leung with the uh, YMCA of uh, uh, Greater Vancouver. Thank you very much for your keynote. You were spot on there, and uh, good governance is something that's so very important. You mentioned one source, which was the CPAs, and I'm actually a CPA myself, so that I've seen that 20 questions. But what else would you suggest in uh, training sources or so forth to get better at governance? I mean, there are, there are so many organizations. I know that there are some that are more um, aligned with the, the private sector, you know, like the Institute of Corporate Directors and similar kinds of organizations like that. There are some, obviously, for um, charities, not for profit. And I think Imagine Canada, there's one, a big one in the U.S. that actually rates. I'm just trying to remember the name. Um, but if you go on, if you just put governance in, on Google, I mean, you could search for hours. Um, and I think a lot of the universities now, too, are starting, certainly the business schools are starting to develop courses and material um, around governance. Um, and I guess it's just, you know, learning. I certainly know in the private sector there's a lot of learning that goes on between directors and experiences that they see in one, on one board uh, and bringing it into another board. Um, and I think it's really through discussion like that and finding, finding the kinds of practices that are appropriate. Uh, some of the practices for the large public companies are obviously not going to be appropriate for a smaller Y, but they can be adapted in some way to be, uh, to be appropriate. Same side. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm John Corlett from the YMCA of Northern Alberta. Uh, from your perspective inside Ottawa for 10 years, are there any lessons to be learned in a federated association like ours from Canadian Confederation and what makes things work and what we ought not to do uh, huh. to make sure that things uh, don't go the wrong way? Because jurisdictional issues, all those things are part of what you would have seen in a particular way. I'm just wondering if there's anything you can tell us about that. We did a number of audits on uh, joint programs between federal government, provincial governments, and municipalities. Um, some of the learnings from that is the accountabilities have to be really, really, really clear. Who, who does what? Who's responsible for what? Um, I've always believed committees can't be responsible for anything. And way too often, certainly at the federal government, you'll often see responsibilities being given to committees, which to me is kind of a sign of disaster about to occur. So it has to be positions or people that are made accountable. Um, there has to be really good mechanisms of communication. Um, I'm not always sure that meetings are the, are the way to do it, but certainly meetings are important. Um, 
people have to understand the role that they play. They have to have some skin in the game as well. Um, it has to be important to them that these projects get done. Uh, clear, clear and good oversight of the specific project itself. Um, and, and again, defining what is success, how do you measure it, and that there be frequent measures along the way. Often, at, certainly at the federal government, I suspect at other levels of government, a lot of these projects take years and years to do. And there will be some end outcome that's been determined. But, you know, after five years, uh, people have kind of may have lost way, you know, lost their way along the way. So there needs to be regular accountabilities, regular measures of progress, timelines, and, and even sort of gates to say, do we continue or not with this project? Um, so the partners all have to be, and it's really about having the partners involved and committed together to that success. Now, I can't believe this is a shy crowd. <laughs> I just want to give you an opportunity to, to talk about something you and I have spoken about before. Um, some years ago, uh, the YMCA of Greater Toronto uh, invited you to hmm. uh, talk to us about our strategic planning process at the time. Uh, when you were Auditor General, and we were very surprised that you accepted our invitation and came to us and met with us and so on. But we ended up speaking about unintended consequences uh, of, of, could you talk, maybe tell the, a bit of the story, but also talk about how sometimes in your role um, uh, you can create unintended consequences and what, what happens in that case? That's a really actually interesting story. Um, as Scott mentioned, I met with the, the Y in Toronto um, and we were talking about accountabilities and audit and the program's uh, requirements from the federal government. And one of the uh, concerns that the Y raised was that the burden of reporting and oversight was becoming so onerous that they felt they might have to actually stop giving some of the programs. And I was surprised, I remember then, to learn that the language programs for immigrants into the country, that I think you had half of the people coming into the country went through your language programs. And so obviously the wide was providing a really essential service um, who was going to pick that up. And, and if it was because of, you know, unnecessary burden being placed on them. So I went back to Ottawa and, and happened to have actually not long after um, a meeting with the, who, the, the, at the time, the president of the Treasury Board, who was John Baird, and mentioned the meeting and said if he, you know, wanted to do something useful. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little free with my opinions. <laughs> um, that he should really look at this whole issue of what was the proper accountability and, and why were they putting these burdens on people doing really good, essential work for the country. And out of that came that whole panel review led by Francis Lankin on the accountabilities and Scott I think was telling me that things had improved. Now, I would say the same, that we did a, the same thing um, with First Nations because everybody was going on about how First Nations were not accountable. I mean, you will hear every, you know, often in the newspapers about First Nations not being accountable for the monies that they receive. And one of the things that we would do, of course, when we would do an audit was we would criticize the government for not knowing what was going on with the money. And then, of course, they would ask these First Nations to produce more and more reports. So I said, well, let's take a different approach to all of this and go to First Nations and see what kind of accountability reporting are they actually doing. And, and I would add, and we can get into a discussion, I do not equate accountability with reporting. I think reporting can be a fall, very bad substitute for true accountability. Anyways, we went to a number of First Nations and found that on average, they were producing something like 200 or more reports for four government departments. Then the Treasury Board did its own study and found that just the Department of Indian Northern Affairs received 60,000 reports a year from 630 First Nations community, 
which means on average, they were producing a report every three days. And then, of course, you say, what happens to these reports? Well, you can guess. There are warehouses in Ottawa full of reports. And so the question is, why, you know, wouldn't the money, and, and of course, you know, their government funds and the First Nations fund people to produce all these reports, and wouldn't that money be much better going to health or education or whatever, rather than to filling out paper that is not being used? I used to use that example a lot in speeches and actually got a letter from the deputy minister at one point sort of telling me to cease and desist <laughs> that things had gotten so much better that they'd actually done this study and fixed it. So he said, oh, great, you know, we'll do a follow-up audit. <laughs> and we'll, if, it's, if it is actually better, I'll be glad to report that. Well, we did the audit and things were not better. So I'm still talking about it. <laughs> but we have to be very careful, I think, when, with the notion of accountability and people thinking that it's reporting. Um, there has to be a little more rationale in that. It, we have to be looking at what are results over a long term, especially some of these programs and many of the programs of the Y as well. It takes a very long time before you see the results. Um, so there has to be, I think, a new way of, of looking at all of this, and unfortunately, um, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. But. Uh, Sheila, I have been introduced earlier, so I don't need to suffice it to say that I'm the guy on whom songs are written. Well, <laughs> at least one song. <laughs> uh, over the course of uh, today, uh, everybody here has heard about the onerous responsibilities, sometimes onerous, that are being placed on the directors, rightly so too. And a guy that is going to recommend tomorrow to the National Council, three new board members who are here. Uh, from uh, your perch and your perspective, given all the fiduciary responsibilities that now directors are answerable for, is it likely to dilute the quality and supply of well-meaning, civil-minded, civic-minded individuals who would otherwise want to be on the boards? I don't believe so. Um, I think people, especially for um, charitable nonprofit organizations, join boards because of the cause uh, and are very committed to that, and those are the kinds of people that you want. Um, I'd also say you probably need to have a good insurance policies. <laughs> Um, in, in place for directors. Um, but, you know, it's the same thing in the, in the private sector. Obviously, you know, the directors in the private sector receive a remuneration. Um, but there have been a lot of lawsuits and a lot of concern that those kinds of responsibilities will um, hinder people going on to boards. Uh, I, I certainly haven't seen any decrease in the interest of people going on to boards. It's, it's, I would say, in many ways, even more onerous for chari charities and nonprofits because of the fiduciary duties. Um, but I still think there will be many good people uh, who will be, remain committed to the cause, who will do, obviously, I hope, proper due diligence before they accept these positions. Um, but there will still be lots of candidates. Do we have one last question for Sheila? Great. Okay, we will make this the last question then. Thank okay. you. Hi, Sheila. Thank you for sharing. Um, so I wanted to ask you a quick question. Um, you mentioned that in respect to accountability, boards should be reflective of their community. And as a young leader here today with a lot of my colleagues as well, what are your thoughts on involving young people in associations? Oh, I think it's absolutely critical. Um, young people are, all, in many ways, I think, an important voice. Um, they are our future. They will bring a perspective that older people, like me, won't, um, and are much more in tune, I think, with what may be going on in communities 
uh, and especially the needs for, for that generation. Uh, so I think it's really important that younger people um, be engaged, be involved, and participate on boards. Um, Sheila, certainly on behalf of the National Board and everyone assembled here at our AGM, I would like to thank you very much for your remarks this evening. Um, I think they were particularly relevant to our Federation um, as we have been working on this transformation and, and the YMCA we want and our position as a charity of choice. And the topic of governance and transparency is certainly one that's top of mind. I think we've learned as an association that um, our individual associations are much stronger when we have an engaged um, board, one that is based on a good trusting relationship between management and boards, and you've certainly reinforced and demonstrated that for us tonight. So thank you. Um, before you leave us, though, I would like to present you with a small token of our appreciation uh, on behalf of everyone here tonight for your thoughts. Um, we're happy to be presenting you and um, all the other presenters during the AGM with a copy of Don't Forget to Write. And it is a look at the Canadian YMCA's through a historical perspective of postcards. The author of this particular book, uh, Patty McGregor, created the book based on a collection of postcards that her father had assembled. Her father, Donald McGregor, was associated with the YMCA as a young boy, uh, became a staff member and served um, on the staff of the Y for 40 years, and then in his retirement uh, was a YMCA volunteer, and during his retirement started this collection of postcards. So we certainly hope that you will enjoy this and uh, reflect fondly on the YMCA as you go through it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much.